My topic is uh, 10 things you should know about socialism. And it's basically based on uh, my book, The Problem of Socialism. And a couple of years ago, uh, Regnery Publishing contacted me. Uh, they contacted Tom Woods first, but he said, he said uh, Tom Woods Incorporated is keeps them too busy. So he, he said, call De Lorenzo. So they, they called me and, said, and asked me if I could, uh, you know, because they had been reading these opinion polls. One opinion poll said 69% of people under 30 said they, could, they would vote for a socialist for president. And, uh, and so that's kind of alarming uh, to hear that in America. And so they asked me if I could put together a, a short book for the millennial generation uh, about you know, making the case against socialism. And they asked if I could do it in uh, five weeks. And, so, and I did. I did. I just, it was in this, in this uh, off, you know, off season. I wasn't teaching. So just all day, every day, four weeks, I turned out the, uh, the book. And so, uh, and so anyways, that's the purpose of the book. And so I thought I'd, I'd so, I'm going to summarize some of, the, some of the main points about uh, socialism, things you, you ought to know about socialism. Maybe these are talking points that will help you debate your... Uh, your commie roommate back at school or, or, or someone like that. Uh, might even help you get kicked out of school, who knows, uh, uh, which would be a good thing for some people. Uh, so socialism defined, you know, the, the classic definition in the early 20th century was government ownership of the means of production. So when you see uh, countries becoming more and more socialist, it means their governments have been taking over various means of production. When, when the British nationalized all, all the, uh, the commanding heights of their economy after World War II, they became more and more socialist. Uh, and so they didn't become totally uh, socialist in, in the central planning sense like the Soviet Union, but they moved, uh, they lurched in the direction of socialism. And now in, uh, in Friedrich Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom, uh, in the 1976 edition, uh, he, he, he argued that over the years, you know, between the early 20th century and, and then, mid-70s, the definition of socialism had changed. He said, that, he said that it changed to include the institutions of the welfare state and the progressive income tax. Because, uh, in his words, uh, the the goal, the ostensible goal, was always egalitarianism or equal, the pursuit of equality through forceful uh, governmental coercion, and the means just changed. He said the original means were the government ownership of the means means of production, and that didn't work out too well, and so they switched to a different means: uh, the welfare state and a progressive income tax. And so that was uh, uh, Hayek's idea. And now, if you, uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in this, read, read at least some of uh, von Mises' book, Socialism. It's a great classic. It's online. It's, on, it's for sale here at the Mises Institute. And in the latter chapters of so uh, Socialism, uh, Mises says that an important part of Socialism is what he called destructionism. And in the spirit of, uh, of Patrick's uh, uh, trying to deciphering of Murray Rothbard's bad handwriting, I wrote it down, uh, Patrick Newman's bad handwriting. I wrote down one of the, just a minute ago, one of the things that Mises said in the, in the book about destructionism. He said, destruction is the essence of socialism. It produ socialism produces nothing. It only consumes what the social order based on private ownership and the means of production has created. And so when you see politicians today who call themselves socialists advocating reparations for slavery, uh, uh, guaranteed annual income, free health care for everybody, free education, free this, free that. That's basically what they're doing. They're, they're saying we want to loot and plunder the fruits of past efforts of production under private property and give it away uh, in order to prop us up, ourselves up as you know, with political power and be sort of... Uh, uh, Uber Santa Claus, uh, you know, just give, giving every giving everything away. Government is Santa Claus is how how I uh, I think of it, and so that's what destructionism is. And that, by the way, uh, the the group of socialists who came to America in the 1940s, who are known as cultural Marxists, uh, their theory was that uh, the reason why the Europeans did not voluntarily embrace socialism was that they were too uh, wedded to the institutions and ideas of Western civilization, including the ideas of capitalism, 
uh, in particular, and private property and so forth, and Christianity. They were too wedded to, uh, to Christianity. Therefore, the ideas and institutions of Western civilization and the ideas of Christianity must be destroyed in order to have socialist utopia. And that, uh, in my view, is why you see all these attacks on the traditional family, uh, on, always on capitalism for sure, and just uh, you know the tearing down of monuments and the, the painting over of murals and things like that. These are all attacks on the institutions of Western civilization, uh, and it's all part of the game plan of destructionism. Okay, so that's socialism. Uh, point number two is uh, socialism will destroy your economic future. I got a laugh last week when uh, the uh, chief of staff of this uh, Cortez woman, the, uh, the, the bartender from Westchester County who got elected to Congress by pretending she's from the Bronx, uh, and the author of the Green New Deal, which Bob Murphy is going to talk about later on today, uh, he admitted, he came out and admitted, he said, it has nothing to do with the climate. It's all about socialism. It's all about socialism. Okay, and so and I, the reason I got a, a chuckle, it's sort of, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, is that all the young people, all the millennials who are on board with this, you know, the Green New Deal, it's all about destroying their economic future with socialism. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, granting tremendous amounts of power to, to creatures like this guy, the, uh, the chief of staff of uh, uh, this woman, the Cortez woman. And that's, that's what it's all about. And so just study history a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the Soviet Union, uh, our friend Yuri Maltsev, who was an advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev, who's, who's lectured here many times, uh, when, he, when he defected from the Soviet Union, he, he started telling uh, our government, the U.S. government, that the size of the U.S. economy was, or the Soviet economy was no more than 5% of the U.S. economy. At the time, the CIA was telling everybody it was 65%. And also at the time, in the 1989 edition of Paul Samuelson's famous textbook, the Principles of Economics textbook, which was the biggest selling textbook in the world from the 1940s until the 1980s, he predicted that, this was 1989, he predicted that by, by 2000, the Soviet economy would be bigger than the U.S. economy. That's, that's what mainstream economics was teaching uh, as college students in 1989 uh, on, the, on the verge of the total collapse of the Soviet Union. But Yuri was right. Uh, Yuri was right. It was more like 5%. The CIA was wrong. It wasn't 65%. Country after country, Africa after, after independence, uh, they adopted Soviet uh, socialism and central planning. Their logo was, quote, only socialism can save Africa. Forty years later, the Af these African countries were poorer than they were under colonialism. Venezuela today, uh, need I say more? Uh, there, there's there's going to be a presentation about the disaster that socialism has created in Venezuela uh, on Saturday, and, and I encourage everybody to go and listen to it. England, after World War II, adopted their version of socialism, Fabian socialism, uh, they nationalized uh, uh, many of the major industries. By the 1970s, the whole world was talking about the British disease because they had ruined their economy, uh, and, they, you know, and, they, and, and that's, what, got, that's uh, what led to the, uh, the election of Margaret Thatcher, who promised, uh, who was a student of Hayek, not a formal student, but she read, she read Hayek, and, uh, and she uh, turned things around quite a bit. Uh, she wasn't... She wasn't exactly a Ron Paul, but, but uh, they did move in the other direction. Uh, Argentina adopted its version of socialism in the 1940s and, and 50s under Perón. And, then, uh, and, and he, of course, quickly ruined the Argentine economy and was replaced with a coup. Uh, and Argentina, uh, like all these other countries, once uh, they destroyed their, the productive capacity of their country, they tried to bail, out, bail themselves out by printing money. And Argentina, by the 1980s, had 12,000% price inflation. Okay. Chile, the same thing. The country of Chile uh, uh, adopted socialism in the 1970s. They ended up with 746% inflation in an economy that simply stood still, just, just destroyed it. And then they were... Uh, 
uh, that government was overthrown by a, a re, sort of a repressive regime uh, after that. So not a, not a happy history of country after country. And you might have noticed that a lot of these countries are de democracies. Uh, uh, Friedrich Bastiat wrote in his famous essay, The Law, that there's really no difference. If, if the government imposes a uniform policy on the whole country, a dictator can do it and a legislature can do it. So there's really no difference. You know, you can impose socialism with a legislature like Venezuela did. Uh, you, don't, you don't need dictatorship to have socialism. You don't need the Soviet Union to ruin your economy. Okay, uh, point number three is you cannot fix socialism. Uh, after, after Bill Clinton left office, there was one of his, uh, one of his top economic advisors uh, uh, penned an article in the New York Times uh, arguing that uh, socialism is not such a bad idea. It just needs to be uh, administered by smart people like us. And, and that's, that's always been uh, the argument by the left that, uh, well, the people, just the wrong people have managed socialism. Well, that ignores economics. That ignores economics. You cannot fix it. The original uh, explanation for why socialism is economically uh, poisonous was the incentive problem. And uh, you know, I, I joke with my principals of economics classes on the first day, I tell them, here's what we're gonna do. We're, I'm gonna give uh, seven exams during the course of the 14 week semester. I'm gonna add up, uh, and then when I get all the grades, those of you who get the low grades, I'm gonna take points away from the good students who got the high grades and give, them, give you some of their points so that everybody gets a C. And I, and I tell them, well, that's academic socialism. That's sort of an example of the incentive problem. And that's not really uh, um, enough of an explanation, though. Uh, you've all learned about the calculation problem. Uh, you, uh, you need uh, private property and market prices in order to have uh, rational economic calculation. And so that's another cause for the ruination caused by, by socialism. Hayek is famous for what he called the knowledge problem, the fact that it's uh, uh, unthinkable that a human mind or even a 100 human minds working with the most powerful computer in the world could possibly possess and utilize all of the information that the millions of workers and consumers and business managers and investors and, and, and on and on have that they use in their daily lives. It's, uh, it's a pretense. His, uh, he called it the pretense of, of knowledge. And then there's also something called you'd call, I would call the public choice problem involved with socialism. Uh, the way Hayek put it was, under socialism, the only power worth having is political power. That is, the way to acquire uh, things to make yourself better off is through politics and political connection, bribery, and, and just plain old politics. Uh, you can't advance by educating yourself, being a producer, being an entrepreneur, serving your fellow man by providing him or her with valued goods and services. That's illegal. That's, you know, the government is control. You're not in control. You're not allowed to do that. And so the way to, to succeed is through politics. And so, so, and of course, the more and more people's time spend, people spend on politics, uh, by definition, the less time they spend producing things. And so that, that extracts even more uh, in terms of time and resources used for production in the direction of transferring what little wealth there is left into your pocket, you, know, you being the rent seeker. You know, the rent seeking you know, involved in politics. So you cannot fix socialism once you have it. Also under socialism, there's a famous chapter in Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, called uh, the worst, Why the Worst Rise to the Top. And, and it made me think of something uh, uh, that I call the sleazometer. <laughs> Where you might put people like Stalin on one end over here, maybe Chuck Schumer over here. <laughs> and then, you know, some of the nicer ones, some of the moderates, like, like this, uh, this woman in England, she seems kind of, she doesn't seem too horrible, uh, Theresa May. But so that's, that's sort of like the, uh, the sleazo meter with the, you know, the, the, the extreme sleaze on, on the left side, on this side over here. And then people who are, they're still sort of uh, coercive thugs, but they're not as bad as Stalin. So not as bad as Stalin. <laughs> And so, and, but Hayek's article is, you know, under socialism, collectivism, he was actually he was talking about collectivism in, in general, 
that it, it's based on uh, using the coercive force of government to compel people to take your orders. You know, the Mises Institute has a new T-shirt. What does it say? It says, uh, uh, every socialist is a, is a secret dictator. That is certainly true. I think that's a quote from von Mises. And so, and it's all a matter of degree. You, know, you had some of the socialist dictators like Stalin who are willing to murder tens of millions of people for merely dissenting. Okay, and Theresa May, I don't, as far as I know, has, hasn't done anything like at all like like that. But she still has inherited uh, the accumulated vehicles of coercion uh, that are the state that have accumulated over hundreds of years in England. And the same thing in our government. Uh, you know, when Donald Trump was elected, he was he accum he uh, inherited the accumulated coercive powers of two hundred and some years of of U.S. government, and then the next person will do the same. Whoever gets elected next time uh, will do the same, and so um, and, and so and so that's always a danger. Even if you have relatively nice sounding people in in power, they've got these horrible weapons at their disposal, and so the worst, you know, the absolute worst. And history is something you should know about. Uh, I had some students at my, my university once. They, it was like the College Republican Club. And on the day when the students all put uh, little tables out on the, on the campus and they were handing out flyers about them, they, they took uh, a couple of them were taking one of my classes. And they had these statistics uh, of uh, mass murders by socialist governments. And they were handing it out. And, and they told me, that none of their classmates had ever heard anything about this. They never knew that a single person died under so because of socialism anywhere. And this is from a book called The Black Book of Communism. There's, there's a sociologist from the University of Hawaii, Rudy Rummel, who uh, wrote a book called Democide. Demo. And what this is, is, is not death by war. This is mass killing of people because they dissented from socialism. They did, they did not want their property taken. They did not want to live under a, a, a tyranny, and as a result, they were murdered in mass. And this is these were seven French scholars who published this book about some 20 years ago, maybe more than 20 years ago now. But uh, also uh, Rudolf Rummel's book. Uh, uh, what, what a career he had, isn't it? You know, cat cataloging mass killing. He spent his whole life uh, uh, working with statistics on mass death. His whole life, he must have been pretty depressed. It wouldn't be the kind of guy you'd want to go out and have a party with. Uh, I what would you talk about? You know, you know, uh, so anyway, the Soviet Union, 20 million. Uh, our friend Yuri thinks that's it's a low ball estimate. China, 60 million. North Korea, 2 million. Eastern Europe, 1 million. Africa, 1.7 million. And so when Hayek said the worst rise to the top, that's the sort of thing he was talking about in his day. This is in the 1940s he was, uh, he was, he was mentioning this. And so uh, you should familiarize your, yourself with that. And this is not to say that Theresa May is the same as, as Stalin, but there's always, there's always, it's all a matter of degree of, of coercion, isn't it? Okay. The next point is that, uh, that most people don't know that fascism is a form of socialism. Uh, fascism, socialism, communism, it's all the same gang as far as I'm concerned. They're all collectivists. After all, the... Uh, you know, when I wrote this book, and I, I did uh, lots of radio interviews, Regnery Republishing had me do 65 radio, radio talk shows in a month. And so I was busy, you know, at one o'clock in the morning, I'm on, on, on the radio with a California radio station. They, and they own several hundred radio stations, the same company, Salem Communica Communications. And the question I've always asked is, people would ask me, uh, well, this is, isn't communism different than socialism? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Soviets, uh, the name of their country was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They didn't call themselves the Union of Soviet Communist Republics. Communism was the utopian ideal that they hoped to achieve in 500 years. But in the meantime, they're all socialists. They call themselves socialists. So it's the same thing. So don't fall for that. And, and, and of course, Hayek and the Road to Serfdom point out that all the fascists of the 20th century, Mussolini, Stalin, and the rest... They were all start. They all started out as socialists, and of course, Nazi. The word Nazi is national socialism. Uh, so the Russians called themselves international socialists. The German socialists called themselves national socialists. But they were all socialists. Just just a different variety of socialism. 
You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a murderer who likes to use guns and he likes to use knives, you know, we're, but we're the same thing. We're both murderers, we guns, knives, what's, what's the difference? And so, in, in the, and of course, another thing they had in common was the literature of the fascists uh, uh, all at- attacked liberalism, classical liberalism. And these are, you know, uh, von Mises' book, Liberalism, which is online also and also for sale at the Mises Institute. You should, uh, you should all read it. Um, and uh, these, you know, the main points, you know, what is liberalism? What are the main bullet points of classical liberalism? Private property, freedom, peace, equality under the law, inequality of income in a free market, limited government, and tolerance. These are the basic ideas that Mises lists there. These are the ideas that were attacked uh, uh, very voraciously by Mussolini himself and Hitler and the Nazis because they understood who the enemy was. These were the ideas and in, the ideas that, that laid the groundwork for the acceptance of, of markets and capitalism and private property. Uh, you, you can't have capitalism and private property and markets if people don't understand the virtues of it. Uh, I guess you can have it, but it's, a lot, it's tough. It makes it a lot, a lot tougher. And so... Uh, here's a few quotes about uh, from the horse's mouth about uh, fascism. Here's um, <clears throat> well, Hayek again. Hayek noted in the, road, in the Road to Serfdom, he said this, the dominant feature of, uh, the, of Nazi Germany, he's referring to Nazi Germany, was a fierce hatred of anything capitalistic, individual profit-seeking, large-scale enterprise, banks, joint stock companies, department stores, international finance and loan capital and the system of what they called interest slavery. They, they, they equated uh, charging a bank charging you interest uh, for a loan as slavery in, in general. He says, uh, uh, quote, uh, the Nazis was, uh, the common characteristic of the Nazis was their anti-liberal and anti-capitalist trend. They even adopted the slogan, quote, the end of capitalism as their accepted dogma. So that was the, that was the slogan of the, of the Nazi uh, uh, ideologues uh, that wrote about that. Mussolini said much of the same thing. Uh, I read Mussolini's uh, autobiography once uh, when I'm doing some of my research, and it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, if, if you assigned, a, say you assigned a class of uh, third graders and said, uh, write a, a, a one-page autobiography, I could see the third grader writing the title, My Autobiography. That, that was the title of Mussolini's autobiography, My, My Autobiography. And I always thought it sounded sort of elementary, schoolish. But he also wrote a book called Fascism, Doctrine and Institutions. He said this, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with the state. It is opposed to classical liberalism, which denied the state in the name of the individual. So that it doesn't get any more clear than that, that there was an attack on classical liberalism. These ideas, uh, being, you had to destroy these ideas first before you could have fascism, in the, in the words of uh, Benito Mussolini. He also complained about, and this is a quote, the selfish pursuit of material prosperity. Uh, he declared fascism to be a reaction against the flaccid materialistic conception of happiness and implored his audiences to, quote, reject the economistic literature of the 18th century. So don't read Adam Smith. Okay, don't read that. It sounds like the kind of thing they tell in American college campuses today. You know, don't read this stuff. You know, it's a racist, it's sexist. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a, you know, Adam Smith was a white guy after all. Why should we pay attention to him? That's... Uh, you know, that's some of the about the level of intellect, intellectual discourse in, in some of the uh, more politically correct universities. And so fascism was basically is, was a variety of, of socialism. And the Nazis, uh, you know, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and Mussolini's Italy uh, were, were basically socialist countries. The, uh, uh, Hayek pointed out in the road to serfdom that in Germany, they, they nationalized, about, uh, the Nazis did, about half of all industry, and then the other half was so heavily regimented and controlled and regulated that it was de facto nationalized. And that's probably the big difference between Soviet socialism and the German and the Nazi socialism is that fascism allowed a degree of private ownership, but it was heavily 
controlled and dictated, uh, you know, what it would do would be dictated by the government, by the state. So, so ownership was not really private ownership uh, since the state controlled everything. And that is why our old friend Bob Higgs, uh, author of the great book Crisis in Leviathan, uh, calls the American economy today participatory fascism. He says, he says businesses are so heavily regulated and controlled that it's like fascism was, but at least they let us vote once in a while. And so it's participatory. But Mussolini was a dictator, of course, and Hitler was a dictator, so he, he couldn't vote. But our, I guess our fascism, Bob Higgs would say, is slightly better than the, the Nazis and Mussolini because uh, it's participatory. <laughs> and so uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a trick politicians always play, isn't it? They, 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 want, they want us to think that they're legitimate because, after all, we voted which is why I never vote. Uh, 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 one of my old essays on lourockwell.com is entitled, Be Patriotic, Don't Vote. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's point number five, I guess. Point number six is that inequality historically is far worse under socialism than under capitalism. Uh, if you read about Venezuela today, for example, I read an a war article in the Wall Street Journal that said uh, Hugo Chavez's daughter, who's in her 30s, has a net worth of about $4 billion. And as far as I know, she never started a business. I don't think she's one of the original founders of Microsoft or anything like that. And $4 billion, And the Wall Street Journal also said that the former finance minister of Venezuela, who I think they said he now lives in Switzerland, had a net worth of $11 billion. Okay, And, and of course, even to this day, you can read articles in the, in the American news media about the political elite in Venezuela still living high on the hog. They have their country clubs and they have their food. And, and you also read about people killing dogs and cats uh, to feed their children, you know, the normal, the ordinary people in Venezuela. And it's always been like that. The, the people who ran the Soviet Union had multiple uh, vacation homes all over, all over the place and, and accumulated great wealth and the masses were equally indigent. Uh, and country after country, uh, you see that uh, the the African potentates who adopted socialists uh, socialism and became uh, dictators after independence in the 1960s, they all lived uh, like kings and queens, and while, while the people starved, and so the the whole business of so, uh, we need socialism to create more uh, equality uh, is is fraudulent. It's uh, it's never it's never been true. It's never been true like that. Not that equality is even a desirable thing, because of course we are all different. Uh, we're all different in uh, in thousands of different ways, and the only way you can uh, move in the direction of trying to force equality is with a totalitarian society. And of course, you can never do that. You can never have equality because human beings are not equal. As uh, uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who gave a talk here some years ago um, on this point, he said that. Uh, he made the point that you know God made all human beings. This is a Jewish rabbi. He said God made all human beings unique, just like He made all stones unique. Stones are all different. Every stone is different. You're not you can't find two stones that are the same. But humans can make bricks identical. You, we can manufacture bricks. You know, like the bricks in a house or a building. You can make those identical. And uh, he posed the question: Do you want to think of yourself more as a stone or a brick? And, and that's, that's what egalitarianism is about, is making us all into identical bricks, uh, uh, if, even if it kills us. <laughs> and you know, where's my, my list of uh, mass murder there? That's, that's always been the, uh, uh, the, the idea, even if it kills us. Okay. Point number seven, uh, <clears throat> the income tax is the essence of socialism. Uh, the income, especially the progressive income tax. This is why in, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, there's a 10, 10 point planks, 10, a plank of the Communist Manifesto, 10 points. Point number one says abolition of private property. Point number, number two is a heavy progressive income tax. Okay. Now, of course, economists, the Austrians and others have studied the income tax. You know, uh, it, it increases the rate of time preference and, and destroys the work effort and has all these bad effects, but it has another effect as well. And I want to read a, a short quote about that from Frank Chodorov. <clears throat> One of the great books ever written on the income tax is The Income Tax, Root of All Evil by Frank Chodorov, which is for sale downstairs at the, at the bookstore, I noticed this morning. 
And here's something he said. He said, when the, when the progressive income tax was adopted in 1913, this is in the United States, the absolute right of private property in the United States was violated. That, of course, is the essence of socialism. Whatever else socialism is, or is claimed to be, its first tenet is the denial of private property. Well, it's in the Communist Manifesto. This is why all socialists, beginning with Karl Marx, have advocated income taxation, the heavier the better. And, uh, and so that's certainly very true. And also, to have socialism, so, you know, the socialists of the world always want a, a centralized governmental power. Uh, they can't allow divided sovereignty or federalism or states' rights, whatever you want to call it, uh, devolution of power. They want centralized power. And nothing, uh, in, in the United States history anyway, so, uh, nothing uh, gave us centralized governmental bureaucracy more than the income tax and the Fed. And so and they both happened in the same year, in 1913. And so the socialists of the world knew what they were doing. And they know what they're doing when, the, when they, they're so worshipful about uh, the income tax because it centralizes power and it basically tells you that you don't own the income that you earn. The government owns all of your income. You are a slave to the government and the government will tell you how much of your income you are allowed to keep by setting the tax rates. You know, it's our income and we will tell you how much you get to keep. And so Chodorov, I think, was right on the money when he, when he wrote that. And the only reason they don't, of course, uh, uh, make the, the rates even higher, they always try to maximize the rates, is they do understand that uh, we will cheat on our taxes and we will, we will stop working and we might even have an armed revolution if they, if they, if they steal, you know, if they make us destitute by confiscating too much of our income. So, so even the, the people who are on my sleazometer uh, have to be careful about that because uh, as Rothbard uh, wrote in quite a few places and it reminded us that any state in, a, in, a, in the world is greatly outnumbered by millions and millions of people. And so any state is always just a relatively small group of people. And so they always run the risk of, of a revolution or a violent revolution. That's why they spend so many resources on propaganda and indoctrination. It's sort of a, a way to quell revolutionary impulses on the cheap. They don't always use violence to put down uh, revolutions. The, you know, the indoctrination and propaganda is also a tool uh, that, uh, that is very essential there. Okay. Point number eight, uh, the Scandinavian countries are about as socialist as the United States is. Uh, one of the myths out there that uh, Crazy Bernie uh, has been spreading is that we need to be more like Sweden. We need to be more like Denmark, these, these Scandinavian countries. They're more socialists, you know, democratic socialism. He says there's a huge difference between socialism and democratic socialism. And he usually spells huge with about 15 or 20 U's in it when, he, when, he, when you see him on, on television doing that. But take a look at this. This is, uh, there's something called the Index of Economic Freedom. It's published, it's published by several different groups. The Fraser Institute in Canada publishes one. Fraser.org, F-R-A-S-E-R.org, the Heritage Foundation publishes one. This is one from the Heritage Foundation. They put together an index of economic freedom. Basically, uh, the more, uh, every country in the world is ranked, and, and if uh, the more, uh, in their opinion, that you safeguard private property, the rule of law, uh, minimal government, uh, minimal regulations, uh, lower taxes, you get a higher rating. And so they come up with an index number for every country. And these are, this is the latest uh, rankings here. The U.S. ranking is, I think, I think the United States is 12th. And the, the number, the index number is 76.8. Denmark is 76.7. So we're about as socialist as Denmark. Sweden and Finland, pretty close, pretty, pretty much the same. So we're, we're pretty much... You know, they're, they're hardly, can be, can be said to be more socialist than the United States. The top ranking goes to Hong Kong, 90.2, just to get you an idea of how far away uh, the U.S. And, the, and the, the Scandinavian countries are, Singapore, 89.2. I think what Crazy Bernie is referring to is, he, uh, is Sweden in the 1950s. In the 1940s, um, the Swedes started, became sort of infatuated with fascist planning, 
And then fascism kind of got a bad name after the Hitler thing. And so they, 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 they ditched that. And they, and they, but they, and they sort of adopting, adopted their own version of socialism and nationalized a lot of industries, very heavy taxes, big welfare state. And according to the Swedish Academy of Economics, Sweden did not create a single net new job from 1950 until 2005. So for 55 years, there was zero job growth in Sweden. And, and Sweden uh, produced, let me get the statistic here. They did the same thing these other countries did. They had, well, they had, they tried to inflate their way out of the, pro the mess they had created. And in the 1980s, they had 500% interest rates in, uh, in Sweden. And so, and that's when Sweden, uh, the Swedish government began to retrench. They privatized a lot of their industries, including a big part of healthcare, and, uh, and, and moved in, in the other direction. So that, that's why today they're pretty close to the United States in terms of their, their ranking. But they pretty much destroyed, they did exactly what Mises did, said about destructionism. They, they lived off the, the past efforts and investments and sacrifices of the great Swedish capitalists of the late 19th and early 20th century that produced a lot of great things uh, for, the, for the world and then uh, and, and ruined it, uh, basically. Okay, so, so the Sweden, Denmark, Finland, they have private enterprise. These are, these are still primarily capitalist countries with, with a big welfare state just like the United States. We, we are a, a, still a primarily a capitalist country. We have private enterprises, uh, but we have a much bigger welfare state than the Scandinavian countries do. And so uh, it doesn't make sense to say we need to be more like them, more socialistic. We already are. We already are. Uh, point number nine, running out of time here. Uh, socialism has caused the worst pollution problems in the history of the world at least the modern history of the world. After the collapse of uh, communism in the late 80s and early 90s, all of a sudden, all these closed totalitarian societies uh, opened up and people could look around and, and learn a lot of things, including the state of the environment over there. Now, at the time, any, any student had studied economics was taught that the root cause of uh, pollution is unregulated free market competition. Uh, the story that you're all told is that uh, industrialists will take into consideration the private cost to them. They have to pay wages and they have to pay for raw materials, but they won't take into consideration the external cost in terms of the pollution and the damage it might cause to your health or to your property or something like that. And therefore, they will produce too much and the government needs to step in and regulate and control uh, production to do that. Well, if that theory is true, and what would you expect the environment to look like in countries that outlawed the pursuit of profit for 50, 60, 70 years? If the pursuit of profit is the root cause of pollution, and then you have a society that outlaws the pursuit of profit, the legal pursuit of profit, for half a century, what would you expect the environment to look like in those countries? You expect it to be pristine, after all, if that's the root cause. Well, the exact opposite turned out to be the, the, the truth and we, there were even books uh, published with titles like Ecocide and the USSR. And, and this is true not just in, uh, in the, country, the Soviet Union and under communism, but Venezuela, yeah, you Venezuela today, Lake Maracaibo, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it. Uh, you know, hundreds of tons of untreated sewage flow into it every day. Uh, when, when British Petroleum had that awful accident in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, an oil platform caught on fire, people died, they immediately set aside $20 billion to pay compensation because they knew they were going to have to pay compensation. Well, Mexico, the government of Mexico, their, their oil platforms catch on fire all the time. And this is the government-run uh, uh, business. And whenever that happens... Um, they deny any liability. Uh, they even denied that there was an oil slick. There was one about uh, seven or eight years ago, and they denied that there was any kind of oil slick or environmental damage. And then uh, Greenpeace uh, took a satellite image of the oil slick that was created by the, the Mexican government's oil platform. And so under, under, so you have a situation there where the capitalists took responsibility for the horrible accident, 
And then when the Mexican government has a, an uh, almost identical horrible accident, I don't think anybody, uh, you know, wanted to, certainly nobody wanted this to happen. Uh, they deny being liable at all. And, and, and so if you look at the history of what happened in the socialist countries, uh, they ruined their, their environments far more than uh, anything we've seen in the United States. Uh, in Russia, the, the Volga River, the steamboats had signs on them saying, don't throw cigarettes overboard, the river may catch on fire. Uh, they, they almost wiped out the Sturgeon population in Poland. People, uh, people would, uh, uh, with uh, lung disease were sent to underground uranium mines for, as, as health clinics. Uh, the fire trucks would have to go through the streets several times a day in the industrial part of Poland, knocking the lead dust out of the air from the factories. Uh, I have an old friend who grew up in former Yugoslavia, and uh, he had, he worked for the government, so he was a government lawyer. Ivan Pongrasik, some of you, the old timers here know who he was. He had, his son uh, was, an, was an Austrian school economist, and they both were. But anyway, he came to this country, but he, he told me once he lived in a 30th floor apartment in Zagreb, and I asked him, why 30th floor? And he said, there's no elevator in the building. And I said, what, are, are you a mountain climber? Or what, what's, you know, what, are you a physical fitness fanatic? Uh, what, what is it? He said, no, the pollution is so bad that uh, you can't, if, if, you're, if you're below the 20th floor, you can't open your windows because you'll die from the lead and cadmium and zinc dust that comes in your house all day long. Can't do that. And so it was, it was pretty awful. And, uh, and uh, under socialism. And so um, and I have a whole chapter on that so you can read the book. I guess... Um, uh, the final thing I'll say is uh, uh, welfare harms the poor. Uh, and, I, I, and I'm running out of time. So, you know, socialist welfare harms the poor. So I'm going to read you one thing about, and there's a lot of literature about how the welfare destroys work incentives, causes family breakup, and so forth. And I'm going to read one thing about what the, uh, an extreme welfare state in Sweden has done to the Swedish people. And this is from our friend Per Byland, who's an Austrian school economist. He, he's lectured here many times. He's a friend of ours. He's a Swedish, uh, he's a Swede, but he, he works, uh, I think he's at Oklahoma State University now. And he said this, I'm quoting Per, when handling out benefits and therefore taking away the individual's responsibility for his or her own life, a new kind of individual is created, the immature, irresponsible, and dependent. The welfare state has created a population of psychological and moral children. The children and grandchildren of the welfare state are indoctrinated at an early age in the government schools that they have a supposed right to free education, health care, and income, and anything else uh, they might desire. And, and of course, you know, when, when you say that, that means somebody else has the obligation to be your slave to work for you. And uh, my old friend Walter Williams, when, when he gives his, uh, one of his canned speeches, um, I've had him in my university several times, he, he kind of shocks some of the students by asking them this question. He says, what would you call a system in which one person is forced with the threats of imprisonment, uh, kidnapping and imprisonment, to work for the benefit of another person? And it usually takes about five seconds for someone to say what? What would you say? Slavery. Slavery, yeah. And then, of course, he describes the welfare state. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, what else would you call that when the average American works until May now to pay, in, pay taxes, for the, mostly for the benefit of other people? You know, what would you call that? And that's what the welfare state has done. And uh, I think I have about one minute left if we have a, a question or two uh, or or uh, br any brilliant declarations or, or anything like that. So on the uh, uh, fascism as socialism, what would you say to the people who, who declare, oh, well, they had private property, you know, they, so they were somewhat capitalist? Well, there wasn't, uh, they, they went along with it. Uh, uh, Hayek uh, criticized the, cap the German capitalists who, went, who themselves went along with this. They, you know, and, and they kept their property, but they, they were happy to keep their property, but then they were regimented and regulated by the government. But that's not real private property. That's not real, you know. You know are you a free man? 
if if everything you do, uh, your schedule every day is determined by me, you know, you know, I tell you where to go, what job you're going to have, how long you have to stay at work, uh, and and so forth, and how to do your job, you're not a free man if, uh, in that sense. And so, if you have a slave master called the state, you're not you're not a free man. And if you have a slave master as a business person, you're not a, a genuinely private enterprise either. And that's basically what uh, fascism was. That's, yeah, one more question, I guess. We're almost out of time here. And what about uh, socialism and culture? What, what some people call cultural and Marxism? Because <coughs> these are mostly economic yeah. arguments. Yes. Uh, for some Latin America, there isn't so that much talk about economic socialism because we have Venezuela as an example. But there are a lot of movements who actually do things to promote what's so called uh, cultural Marxism. Yeah. Yeah, that's well that's the that's the brand of Marxism that infects the United States today too. Uh, but we do have still have people who are making the case for economic socialism. It's still you know they're they're you can't separate the two, really. Uh, the history of this, uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote a little essay, it's on lourockwell.com, called uh, Misesian Destructionism, Then and Now. And, uh, and I summarized some of this. But uh, the cultural Marxists, uh, these were uh, European immigrants, came to America and, and, uh, and became extremely influential. Their ideas totally dominate American universities now and probably in your country uh, as well. And what they said was that uh, th these were all people who tried to bring uh, Marxism, Marxian socialism to Europe, and they failed. The people did not go for Marxian socialism in Europe. It was imposed on Eastern Europe after, after the war, but, but the people themselves did not want that. And they decided the reason for that was the institutions of Western civilization, like I said earlier, uh, had, had uh, free market economics, the ideas of liberalism, uh, constitutionalism, democracy, all these things, uh, the people did not want to give that up. And also Christianity. You know, if God is your sovereign, then some politician cannot be your sovereign. God is your sovereign. They didn't want that. They wanted themselves to be your sovereign and uh, to order you around. And, and that's how else could they achieve socialist utopia? And so they said very clearly uh, in, in, their, in their writings that their, their objective would be to destroy Christianity and to destroy the institutions of Western civilization. And that's what political correctness is all about. That's what uh, cultural Marxism is all about. That's what's, what's going on. All the attacks on the traditional family, especially the traditional family. You know, one of these, one of these characters was a Hungarian, Lukács. And uh, when uh, uh, he, his party got into the control in Hungary, this is the early 20th century, he was some sort of, I think they made him a minister of culture, and he started advocating all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, wife swapping and all sorts of, you know, anything to destroy uh, the traditional family, and they were kicked out. They, you know, you know they were, the Hungarians said, get out of here. They, they didn't want that. And so, uh, and this is one of the people now who is like one of the, the leading lights leading intellectual lights of cultural Marxism, you know, even though he's long dead. Uh, and so, uh, and see, see there's, these are the people that, whose ideas have been embraced by the, the American left in academia, and they totally have taken over, like, like in your country. But it's, but it's connected to economic socialism, right? because their objective is they want some essentially planned totalitarian society, uh, but uh, they have to get rid of these institutions first, that keep the existing society together. Destructionism. So it's all about destructionism that I opened my talk with. That's what cultural Marxism is. It's about destroying these existing institutions. And Marxists have always been like, they've always been about destructionism, even if they have no idea what will come next. They just want to destroy what is. And then, well, we'll worry about that later. It's kind of like when Nancy Pelosi said, pass the Obama law and we'll figure out what it says later. That's a classic example of how the Marxists have always uh, thought about these things. And I guess my time is up in uh, coffee break time. Thank you. <laughs>